welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast, the tough-talking, advice-giving show by the not-really-mean mean lady, lady, Susan J. Ellie. Uh, just then, welcome to episode 64. I know this episode's a bit late because last week I had a week from hell, and one of the things that happened was my microphone completely died. And it was the second Blue Yeti that I bought in a year, and I wasn't going to buy a third one. So I had to spend some time researching new microphones and figuring it out. And then my printer died and I was behind on bonuses. So if you're a meanie and you have bonuses due, I will be spending this 4th of July while the rest of the country is celebrating. I'll be working on those bonuses. So have no fear. At first I was going to tell everybody what happened last week, but it got to be way too much. But one of the things that impacted the podcast was the microphone going down and the new microphone is completely different. I don't know if it's an interim solution or a long-term solution. We'll figure that out. I did a few practice recordings last week. I didn't like the way they went. At, they came out. So we'll see how this goes. I might have to invest in either more equipment, like an audio interface or another microphone, but we'll see what happens. Anyway, speaking of things, I want to thank my meanies. I want to especially thank my moderator, Dave, who put a note in the Facebook group about supporting the podcast. Thank you guys so much. I have some new meanies. And for those of you who regularly listen to the podcast, I usually do a shout out to some meanies on every episode. So if I don't get to you on this one, I will get to you on another one. I want to thank Angela. I want to thank Jonathan for increasing his support. And I want to thank Dawn. And I want to thank Mira. And if you are a new meanie and you just came aboard, I will be thanking you in a future episode. And I just really appreciate you guys' support. And hopefully the podcast will continue. And I really love making the podcast. I just can't carry it by myself. And I really, really appreciate the support, guys. And like I said, I'm making changes to the website. And there will be some member-only material on there. I'm also bringing my classes onto the website from Thinkific. There will be classes on there. And anybody who's a meanie will be getting special discounts for those things. So... Have no fear, guys. More benefits are on the way if the podcast continues. And at this point, it looks like it will. I will be very grateful and will continue to increase your benefits. So thank you so much for this. And I want to thank you guys for becoming meanies. And if you don't know how to become a meanie, just go to the website, meanladytalking.com. Scroll down on the very first page and there is a little button that says become a meanie and you click it and you can go right to Patreon and become a meanie. So I thank you so much for your support. It means a lot. Anyway. I know that I'm late. And if you're a meanie and you sent me an email and asked me to talk about certain things, this is not that podcast. I think that if you're a meanie and you support the podcast, you can have an episode all to yourself. What this podcast is going to do is going to cover some of the emails that I've gotten over the past few weeks from people who aren't meanies, but they ask me questions or they suggest topics or there's different things they want to know. The way the blog began was that I started the blog when I was teaching a generic GPYP class and I would get a lot of student emails. People would ask me a lot of different things. And instead of answering each email separately, I would just write a blog post that would address one or more topics. So that's what I'm going to do in this podcast. And the only notes that I have in front of me are the notes that are the questions and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. One person did ask me how I arrived at the different facets of getting past your breakup because getting past your breakup is a very successful breakup program. I say that it's the most successful breakup program in the world and there's lots of reasons for that. One reason is that it's based on my process and my extensive field experience of working with clients over the years. Now, there are certain things I did that worked for me that didn't work for other people and are not included in GPYB. I would ask one client or when I was running volunteer groups, I would ask some, some people in the volunteer group, once try this, once try that. And it didn't work for the majority of people. What's in GPYB is what works for the majority of people. But I've told everybody it cannot be done a la carte. And there are certain things that I did in my 
individual process that I don't teach in GPYB because I'm not qualified to do it. I've mentioned the John Bradshaw in a child stuff. I did that. I, did, I went to a John Bradshaw conference over the weekend. I did that work. I do have some private clients who are doing that work so I can work with them. I can speak to their inner child stuff. I can give them exercises, things like that. But I'm not qualified to do teaching on that subject. I don't feel like I am. So I don't do it. A lot of my clients and former students are 12-step people. They follow a spiritual program. I recommend Melody Beatty. I recommend Robin Norwood. I recommend John Bradshaw. These are all 12-step people. They all talk about spirituality and the 12 steps. But I do not feel in any way, shape, or form qualified to be a spiritual leader. And I I want GPYB to be open to everybody. It's gender neutral, length of relationship neutral, sexual orientation neutral, age neutral, basically. It's also religious and spiritual neutral. If you're an atheist or an agnostic, this is not going to turn you off with maybe you should pray about it, maybe you should do this, maybe you should do that. I don't feel qualified to do that, and I don't want to turn people off. If you're a spiritual person, if you're in 12 steps, you're a religious person, you belong to a church, that's your stuff. I mean, that would make wonderful additions to this program. This program is not in opposition of any of that stuff. So you can do your spiritual or religious practices and GPYB because it's completely neutral on the subject of religion or spirituality or anything like that. And I don't feel qualified to speak to that. I had 10 years of Catholic school. I had many years in 12-step programs. I've studied Buddhism. I've studied a whole lot of things. But I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going to preach to people. I don't feel qualified to preach to people and I stay in my lane. I teach what I know backwards and forwards. If there's some stuff I just dabble in, I don't teach it. I don't teach it. I know grief. I know relationships. I know personality disorders. I know attachment. I know all that stuff. I teach it. I could teach it blind. But there are certain things I don't teach. I don't want to teach. And I'm not going to teach. So some people have asked me questions about that. And I wanted to address that straight up. But there are parts of the GPYB program that people don't do the way they really should be doing it. One of those things is observation. And I really believe that part of the reason why people don't do observation is because part of observation involves unplugging. And people don't want to unplug. It's like you're asking them to take their right arm off. And I'm not. If you have done a boot camp with me, you know that I always ask that observation, the way it's done in the workbook, is part of your finished assignments. Now, the workbook is available at gettingpassurebreakup.com. And I'm working with somebody to get it on Amazon, but it's not there yet. So if you want it, go to gettingpassurebreakup.com, go to GPYB resources, and you'll be able to get the workbook there. But other people that are not my boot camp and not working with me have a tendency to gloss over the observation exercises in the workbook, and they're very important. Observation is very important, and that's one of the reasons why I tell people not to turn their electronics over to their kids. Don't make it a distraction. Don't make it a babysitter. Don't make it a hear, shut up, take this, and be quiet, because children need to learn to observe. They need to be quiet and sit still and look at the world around them. If we don't insist upon that, if we give in to their whims, especially with electronics, We're leading them like lambs to the slaughter. Observation skills are very important and it's important to teach to children. I used to teach body language as part of a course. I did a general psychology course and I've been thinking about bringing this back and putting it on the website. And part of body language, part of reading body language is about figuring out if somebody's telling the truth. Now, there are certain things that always make its way into the pop culture vernacular, different things that people learn They learn to look for different signs. And one thing that people have always been taught is that if somebody can't look you in the eye, that means that they're not telling the truth. But something that's good to know is that many people who are either personality disordered or have committed some heinous crime and know that you're going to be looking for them to look away, they tend to do this unnatural stare. They tend to lock their gaze on you. 
One example of that is Chris Watts, the morning that his family was reported as having disappeared. When he was talking to the police officer, and this is all on the police officer's body cam, he locked his eyes straight ahead. It was very unnatural, but I'm sure that he was aware of the fact that he had murdered his entire family and that the cops were going to be looking at him to look away. But when police officers are taught about interrogation techniques, they don't rely on somebody looked ahead or looked away because they know that people who have personality disorders, people who have just committed a heinous crime, they very often do the lockdown stare that to the untrained eye, it might look like, oh, look, he didn't look away. So therefore he's telling the truth. He doesn't know where his family is. He didn't just slaughter them all, but he did. And observation is about learning to hone your instincts. And when people are lying, another thing that they do is, and this is very subtle, they'll be saying no, but their head will be instinctively nodding yes, or they'll be saying yes, and their head will be instinctively shaking no. But it's often very, very subtle. You have to learn to pick up on it. And the way that you learn to pick up on it is to observe what normal people do. And you can't be observing what normal people do if if your head is looking at this little rectangular device in your hand and never looking at anyone straight in the face to see what the hell it is they're doing. Pathological liars, and if you've been involved in a liar, you need to learn how to figure this out. And I'm not giving you a lesson on body language here. I'm just saying why observation is important. What police interrogators do is they will ask a suspect to tell them the story. And a pathological liar or somebody who has committed a crime and wants to get the story down straight will have it in strict chronological order. But the pathological liar always puts in all these details, these grandiose stories. And what police investigators do many times is they try to get them into a part of the story that is in strictly chronological order. You know, well, right before you found the body, what happened? So they'll jump to the middle. They'll go to the middle to the end. They'll go to the middle to the beginning. They'll jump all around. Now, you don't want to interrogate people. You don't want to act like you're interrogating people, but you could use this as you didn't really remember what they said about this. So you jump into one part of the story versus another part of the story. And a lot of times that trips up even the most pathological learned liar. They have to keep things in straight chronological order. If you ha- if you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. So very often times, it's good to just ask people to repeat a part of a story. Um, I forget, what did you tell me happened at 3 o'clock when the story started at 10 a.m.? Uh, wait, what? When did you go to the store again? And you jump around the story and... It trips them up most of the time. And they also give details. They give details that nobody cares about, but they're trying to make the story come to light. That's what they do. Normal people don't put that amount of detail in a story. The other thing they do is called duping delight, which means when they're telling you a story, they're completely full of crap. They think that they are getting one over on you and their mouth gives it away with a bit of a smile. And they smile about things that they shouldn't be smiling about. And one example of that was Diane Downs, who was a mother who shot her three children. And she was giving interview after interview after interview. She really dug her own grave. And one a famous interview was she was talking about her daughter throwing up blood after she had been shot. And she's actually unable to control her mouth which turns into a smile. It was disgusting, and it was so obvious that she was the person who shot the children. Anyway, the point of this is that you have to look very closely at things, especially if you were in any kind of relationship where you had been lied to, where your partner had been cheating, your partner had been lying, your partner had been doing this. You have to learn to look closely at things. And a lot of times people will say to me, well, I'll start observation when I'm dating. It's like, no, you have to start now. You have to start it with people that you know are not liars. You have to start it with people that you know are telling the truth. You have to watch how a normal person tells a normal story. You can't do it if you're staring at your phone 24 hours a day. And one of the things that people that teach interrogation techniques and people that teach body language and teach about lying and how to pick it up in body language, they rail against social media because they say when we're on social media and we're liking people's stuff that we know is just crap, and I've talked about this before, I've talked about Facebook Lives, we become complicit in the falsity. 
And whenever everybody in the world is showing their good side, their good side only, we don't leave room for people to tell us how things really are. So we, in essence, are saying, lie to me, lie to me, lie to me. And people who do this for a living, people who train people in interrogation techniques, people who train people to spot liars have been warning about this over the past few years. They've been talking about how social media is turning everyone into a liar. And it's not just that you're putting your stuff out there and twisting it in a way that it shouldn't be twisted, but you are complicit in someone else's falsity when you're liking their picture, like, oh, how cute, it's so wonderful, ba ba ba. oh, your husband adores you. And you know, as sure as hell, that what's going on behind closed doors is a whole lot of craziness. So try not to be complicit in other people's lies. And how do you do that? You say, well, you know what? I'm not doing as much social media as I used to do. I'm sorry if you put something up and I don't like it or I don't see it, I don't comment, but I'm trying to do other things than just live on social media. So go to the workbook, go to the observation exercises and start doing them. And you will be amazed when you start unplugging and you start unplugging as much as I recommend the amount of perspective you will get back. And if you have any plans anytime soon to go out dating, you need to hone those observation techniques. And if you have children, you have a duty to those children not to use electronics as a distraction, as a device, as a quiet down, simmer down. You need to teach the children what's going on in the world so that they understand what danger looks like. Because danger often looks like a guy with a puppy saying, oh, you want to pet my puppy? Danger doesn't look the way we think danger looks like. It's not the big bad boogeyman. Usually it's a nice, normal looking guy with a puppy. Or it's the ice cream man. Or it's somebody that has a sound that sounds like the ice cream man. But I just wanted to give the lying, this wasn't a, a lesson in how to tell the people are lying. If people are interested in that, I'll do a class on it. Just let me know. I'll do a class on body language, not just lying. But I just wanted to point that out as liars are so subtle and people that are really good at lying are really good at lying. And the, and you have to look for a cluster of things. It's usually not one thing. It's usually a cluster of things. But you can't look for them if you're not looking at somebody. And if you've gotten out of the habit of looking at people, you're not going to get it. So part of observation is being vigilant. And part of being vigilant is unplugging. You have to do it. So start to bring more observation into your daily life. It will really help you. Now, when I first started this journey... I was what I call passively suicidal. I wasn't suicidal as in I didn't have a plan, but I become very careless when I was driving. I was severely depressed and I didn't really care if I got hit by a bus or not. So my therapist took me to Butler Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island to be evaluated for depression. And it turns out that I was clinically depressed and I was put into this program that they had there. And it was a very good program, but my husband came for family counseling and in family counseling, he told the psychiatrist he didn't want to be married to me anymore. And when the psychiatrist said that to me, it just struck me in my heart. I don't know why, but it did. And I like find it laughable now. But my husband was telling him that one of the reasons he didn't want to be married to me was because the money was disappearing. The money wasn't disappearing. The money was being spent on the things that we had to spend it on. I wasn't even allowed to go out and get my hair done. I wasn't allowed to go out and get clothes for work. I used to sneak lunch money and go buy myself clothes and bring it to work and leave it there and then change when I got to work in the morning. But this psychiatrist, and I find this really objectionable after going to school and working in psychiatric services for a long time, I now find this very objectionable, but I didn't know what to do about this then. The psychiatrist assumed that I was doing drugs, which is crazy because if I was spending money on drugs, I was in this program eight hours a day, I would have been withdrawing all over the place. But I was an anxious mess, I was a depressed mess, and he wouldn't give me any medication. And what he gave me was the relaxation tapes. He gave me this little tape recorder, these little relaxation tapes, and I had to go into a darkened room four to five times a day. And I was able to do it at the hospital because we had off times in this program. And I was able to go in there and I was able to listen to the relaxation tapes. And it really helped me. I mean, it really, really, really helped me. The other thing that he had me do was coloring mandalas. And I've talked about this a whole lot. 
And the mandalas that I colored were very intricate. I, I colored them with colored pencils, and he would tell me to color with colored pencil and listen with classical music. So I had these little headphones. I had a few cassettes of, of classical music, and so I'd sit there at the table when my hands were shaking, when I was obsessing like a crazy person, and I would listen to classical music through my headphones and color mandalas. And it was really relaxing, and it really helped me. And it helped my anxiety, and it helped my obsession. So there were some good things that came out of the fact that he wouldn't give me medication because he was trying to find other techniques that I could use for my anxiety and depression without giving me medication. But we're supposed to go to occupational therapy and I don't know what this has to do with occupation, but you basically get down and you find out arts and crafts and they have all kinds of different things that you can do. And it was another thing that I recommend all the time is to have some crafts that you can use with your hands. It really, really helps, especially if you have anxiety issue. It really helps. So we had to take an aptitude test, find out what we were good for, what would be the best thing that you could do. So it was a group of about eight of us, and I became really good friends with like four people in the group. And we were a close group, and they really helped me for the six weeks that I was in this program. And one of the people that were in the group I stayed friends with for a fairly long time afterwards, but we take our aptitude test and then we go down into this little room downstairs where they have all kinds of arts and crafts and this and that. We go down there and the therapist says, okay, you go to ceramics, you go to woodworking, you go to stained glass, you go here, you go there. And so she gets to me and she points me over to this table. I go to this table. I swear to God, everyone there had had a lobotomy. I swear to God. Or they were so medicated, they're nodding off. They're sitting at this table gluing rocks to cardboard. I swear to God, that's what they're doing. Gluing rocks to cardboard. I'm like, this is my group? This is my group? I, I went up one side of the therapist and down the other. And I said, do you know how high my IQ is? I'm educated. And these people are drooling on themselves. They all look like they had a lobotomy. And they're gluing rocks to cardboard. She pulled me into a stairwell because I was raising my voice so much. So she goes, what do you want to do? I said, well, let's ceramics. Let's try ceramics. I went with ceramics. I made a complete and utter mess out of the whole thing. I couldn't do it to save my life. And she would come by because I was trying all kinds of different things. She would come by and she'd say, so, Miss High IQ, how you doing? And we'd be like, oh, shut up. Uh, it took me, like, I just, I couldn't do anything. I just kept, I mean, I didn't want to glue rocks to cardboard, but I, I didn't know what was a step up from that because I couldn't seem to find it. For ceramics, definitely wasn't it. Maybe coloring with colored pencils was it, but I couldn't figure out what else I could do. Eventually, I found I could crochet a bit, and I'll talk about that at some other point, but I found that doing arts and crafts, which were a little bit more intricate than gluing rocks to cardboard, really did help. I mean, there really was good stuff there. And that's why I recommend that as part of the GPYB program, especially if you have obsession, especially if you have anxiety. And eventually, and I've put this on many posts and building your life and stuff. I did painting, I did traveling, I did photography, I did all kinds of things, but I couldn't do ceramics. So, and I didn't want to do gluing rocks to cardboard. So those were two techniques that I learned, the relaxation tapes and doing things with my hand, coloring mandalas and eventually crocheting became a very calming activity for me. And I was never very good at crocheting either. So it's not like I became this wonder of the world doing arts and crafts because I'm really not good. But I do go to craft stores. I've done things like silk flower arrangements. They're not that hard to do. I have painted, I've done things like that, but you should find things to do with yourself and enjoy those things. So I was doing the relaxation tapes and I was carrying those things around like a security blanket. I just could not get enough of the relaxation tapes and I recommend that to everybody. I, I'll put the links to um, a woman that I really like, a relaxation. I had a boot camp last fall and I was telling them about talking about not teaching things that I'm not very good at. I was saying that when I do a woman's retreat, I always do some meditations, but I always do recorded meditations because I'm not very good. I just don't have the voice for teaching people meditation or having people meditate. And one of the women in the boot camp said, yeah, I could just hear you doing meditation. You will relax those arms. You will relax those legs. Now go to sleep. But truly, I can't do meditation. 
So I, I'm going to put a link in the show notes to this episode of a woman that I recommend for meditation, also Stephen and Andrea Levine. A few years after my famous relaxation, dragging this cassette player around like it was a security blanket, I was doing my grief work and I was going to all kinds of grief conferences and I discovered Stephen Levine. I had read an article on him and I remember the quote was, the road is hard, but love softens it. And it's, a, it's a quote that I've used many times over the years. So I heard that he was coming to Boston. I was living in Massachusetts and I'm like, I'm there. And I walk in. I think I've told this story, but I walk in and there's rows and rows and rows of chairs. I'm early. The place is empty. And I take a seat like third or fourth row in the center. And when I first started this journey and I first started going to 12-step programs, I was desperate. I've often said if they told me to stand on my head and spit nickels, I would have done it. I would have done anything, including coloring things and going into darkened rooms with relaxation tapes, anything. I was a sponge. I just wanted to absorb everything that I could learn so that I could stop feeling the way that I was feeling. But around two years along, I started questioning everything. I've always been kind of rebellious. I've always been kind of a sarcastic <laughs> asshole sometimes to be perfectly honest and I was started giving my sponsors my therapists and everybody else a hard time and like I said I dated uh I date I was dating two guys once and my therapist kept warning me that I was gonna fall on my face and I kept saying I didn't care I was having a good time so I went through this very rebellious phase and I remember I just stopped liking everything and I was just getting very stubborn about things. And my sponsor said to me one day that there was a quote in the AA big book that said, prejudice is contempt without prior investigation. And I was like, okay, so how much investigation do I need to do before I don't like something? And he says, you don't stop, do you? And I was, I wasn't stopping at that particular point. I was like, yeah, sometimes I stop. So I was even arguing with him about that. And of course, some of the things that I tell people is I know I piss you off, but don't drop the GPYB program because I piss you off. Because there were many times that my sponsors, my therapists, my support groups, they piss me off. But I didn't turn away from the things and the programs that they were teaching me about because I needed it. And many times they pissed me off for my own good. It was like, get out of your box, get out of your box. And many times I get in people's faces and they stop doing the GPYB program. If you're pissed at me, that's fine. I can take it. Honestly, I can. I have thick skin. But don't turn away from the program that you need. Wipe me out of it and take the tools that the program gives you. So there I was being haughty. And a couple of years after that, I was going to the Stephen Levine conference and I was in graduate school and I, I walk in and I take my seat, third or fourth row center and these people start coming in and everybody who's coming in is wearing these long flowy caftans and Birkenstocks and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And I'm sitting there in this chair and they start sitting on the floor. They, they had the meditation pills, which I didn't know what they were at the time. They had these meditation pills and they're all camping out on the floor. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? I mean, I'm sitting there, I'm dressed. I have black pants, black socks, black high top sneakers, a black leather jacket, and like a blue shirt. It was like the only color on me. I look like a kid from the Bronx is ready to rumble. And these people look like they're ready to fly off to the heavenly gate. I'm like, what is going on around here? I was horrified. I'm like, what is happening? And I'm sitting there in the seat. And I mean, the the, the floor is filling up and the chairs are not. And I'm sitting there going, okay, prejudice is contempt before prior investigation. And I'm feeling lots of prejudice here because this is freaking weird. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And I'd heard that Stephen Levine was from Brooklyn. I was like, and these are his followers? So I'm sitting there and I'm watching the people come in. They give me a little smile, a little wave. I mean, they're not judging me. I'm judging them like a crazy person. You know, they're all namaste and I'm all like, namaste my ass. Like, I don't know what's going on. What the hell? So I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, how much investigation do I need to give this before I get up and leave? Because if it's them on the floor and me sitting here, this is not going to happen at all. They look like they're ready to be beamed up into outer space. I don't know what's going on and I don't know at what point I need to leave and how much investigation I need to do here. 
So eventually people started coming in and, and filling in the chairs and they weren't all wearing that outfit and things were good. And we weren't at a Grateful Dead concert. We were actually not going to all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. We were actually going to listen to Steven and Andre who came out in these caftans. I was like, oh my God, I thought he was from Brooklyn. What the hell is this? But it was magical. It was a magical weekend. So I was glad I didn't get up and leave. I was glad that people dressed in normal clothing came in and I learned how to meditate that weekend. I learned how to really meditate and it brought me back to the days of relaxation. So I was glad that my contempt before prior investigation didn't push me out the door. I was glad that I was able to do that. And I started a meditation practice and I was in a relationship at the time and my boyfriend went to see Steven at some other weekend and he got into it and we both got into it and it was nice. It was good. It was lovely. But I just want you to not judge GPYB by me, whether you don't like me, you don't like my attitude, you don't like what I'm wearing, you know, whatever. Don't turn away from the program because of that. That weekend of Stephen Levine is one of the most spectacular weekends of my life. And there's an audio that he and Andrea did of that year. And I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but it was spectacular. I just had such a great time. And I'm really glad that I didn't leave. And in the Power Affirmations booklet, I talk about positivity on the brain. I talk about meditation. I talk about mindfulness. There's a things I recommend. And in the Power Affirmations booklet, I talk about the neuroscience and the neuroplasticity, all of these things that have been proven by people who work in this field, who've done brain scans, and they see the effect of these things on the brain. It's a very positive thing. The meditation, the relaxation, the mindfulness, these are all things that people who study the effects of things like this on the brain, things like gratitude lists, all the things that I talk about in the Power Affirmations booklet, this is all backed by science. To inject more positivity into your life is to have a really positive effect on your brain. It's not just about relationships. It's like you have more energy. You have more courage. So if you don't have a meditation practice, a relaxation practice, a mindfulness practice, please start to look into some of this. Now, a couple of years ago, not this past December, but the December before I was sick in bed. I had a lupus flare that I thought was going to kill me. I couldn't get out of bed. My head was pounding. I couldn't get on the computer. I couldn't do much of anything. I basically laid in bed writhing around and I turned on the TV. I think I turned it to HBO to watch something and then I lost the remote. I don't know where it went, fell out the window. I don't know what happened to it. And the movie Everest came on. And Everest was not the type of movie that I would watch, but the movie Everest came on and I was stunned by this movie. And it's about the 1996 storm that came up suddenly and people were on the summit and a whole bunch of people died and somebody lived and it. it's a big, big thing. After that movie, I became obsessed with all things Mount Everest. I never had any kind of interest in Mount Everest, anything that went on in Mount Everest, whatever, nothing. I was obsessed. And I was telling my friends, like, I'm going to climb Mount Everest. <laughs> They're like, hey, you can't get out of bed. You're going to climb Mount Everest. But I wasn't really. I was just saying that because I couldn't stop talking about it. I just kept, I kept watching everything. I kept going on YouTube, everything about Mount Everest. I couldn't get enough of it. And I was talking about it nonstop. People thought that I was losing my mind. My friends are like, yeah, you can't get out of bed. You're going to go like climbing Mount Everest. <laughs> like, good luck with that. But I really became very intrigued by people and their stories. And one of the stories that I was really intrigued about was I came across this movie called Miracle on Everest. And it's the story of Lincoln Hall. And Lincoln Hall was a mountaineer and mountaineer means that he wasn't just somebody that now there's people that just decide they're going to climb Mount Everest. They've never climbed any other mountain in their life. And they're just like going to climb Mount Everest. That's what I'm going to do. And these fools that, you know, run around doing this and die as a result of it. And they're very, very experienced mountaineers that die on Mount Everest as the 96 thing shows. But Lincoln Hall had arranged an expedition in the 1980s and they were going to go up, were going to summit on a way that hadn't been done before, something to that effect. But anyway, he had arranged this expedition and on the morning where they're supposed to summit, he was feeling very cold, cold in your hands and your feet. And people who are experienced mountaineers know that if you can't walk, you're going to die. 
because you enter what's called the death zone on Mount Everest and getting up is one thing, getting down is a whole other story. So as disappointing as it was, he decided he was not going to summit. His friend Greg Mortimer summited. It was supposed to be spectacular, wonderful, uh, awesome. But 22 years, Lincoln Hall is kind of thinking about his failure to summit. So he decides he's going to go back. He becomes part of an expedition led by a Russian named Alex. And he gets up the morning that he's supposed to summit. He summits. Everybody's fabulously happy for him. They call his family. He has a wife and two kids in Australia. And everybody's happy that he summited because he had been so disappointed the first time. On the way down, and he didn't get down that far, he gets felt by cerebral edema. And cerebral edema is when your brain swells at altitude. And sometimes people come down off Everest and they just die. They just fall down and die. You never know what the effect of altitude is going to be on your body. Everybody's different. Everybody has different responses to being up that high. Some people could be in the best shape of their lives and they can't handle it. I've watched so many things on Everest and every story is different and how people meet their end on Everest. A lot of times it's random events. Sometimes it's a culmination of a different, a few different factors that happen. Sometimes they're just coming down. They're very healthy. They did everything right. They summited at the right time. They didn't stay that long. They come down. They're doing everything right. They just fall over and die. It's very unclear how being up at that altitude is going to affect you. So Lincoln Hall's coming down. He's been mountaineering for 30 years. He knows what he's doing. And then when he's still way up there, and he's there with three Sherpers, Sherpas. I know that with my Bronx accent, I tend to say Sherpers, but it's Sherpas. So he's with three Sherpas and and they're coming down and he's feeling the effects of cerebral edema. He's just hallucinating. He's acting like a crazy person. He's trying to fight the Sherpas. He's doing all kinds of things. And they radio down to the expedition leader and saying, what he's doing. They sent up a fourth Sherpa and part of coming down off of Everest is you have to repel down these sheer cliffs. And at one point they're trying to get this guy who's acting like a madman to repel down. And the Sherpa that had come up to help them is on the other rope trying to guide him to come down. And he's completely out of control. And he hits the Sherpa really injures him because he hit him with his crepons, which is the spiky things on the bottom of your boots. And he really, he really hurt him. Because he's completely out of control and they're still having trouble getting him down. This goes on for hours, hours. He's hallucinating and then he just passes out in the snow. At that altitude, you can't carry people down. It's like not only are your muscles weak, but everybody weighs like four times what they what they normally weigh. And there's this whole thing that goes on. I'm not going to talk about Mount Everest forever, but there's this whole very intriguing discussion about saving people on Mount Everest. And can you do it? Should you do it? Walking past people that are obviously in trouble, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to get into any of that, but there's a whole ethical thing that goes on and Lincoln Hall has done lectures on that, et cetera. So hours go by and finally, and when he passes out, they know that if they leave him here, he's going to die. And I think that they thought that he was dead already because I think that they couldn't find him breathing or they couldn't tell that he was breathing. They were trying to get him to breathe. Alex, the expedition leader, told the Sherpas to come down because even though the Sherpas are in much better shape to handle the altitude on Mount Everest than Westerners are, they can't stay there overnight because they would die too. So he orders the Sherpas to come down and they take Lincoln Hall's stuff. They know he's not going to last the night here. And they take all his stuff to bring to the family. Everything. They take his oxygen. They take his backpack. They take everything. And he's laying in the snow. He wakes up hours later. And he knows where he is. And he's been mountaineering for 30 years. He knows where he is. And he knows that he can't move. He can't try to get down off the mountain because in pitch black, he'll just probably fall. He doesn't really have any climbing equipment. He doesn't have any oxygen. He doesn't have anything. And he's way up there. So... What he does is he was practicing meditation and yoga for many, many, many years. He was a practicing Tibetan Buddhist and he had done meditation for many years. And he knew that he was going in and out of consciousness. He knew that he was hallucinating at some point. 
but he also knew that if he went back to sleep, he was going to die. And he used all kinds of meditation techniques and all kinds of yoga breathing and things like that to keep himself awake overnight so that he could get down in the morning. So in the morning, this group of climbers is coming up. The best time to summit at Mount Everest is about nine in the morning so that you have all day to get back down. So people typically start for the summit like midnight, three o'clock in the morning, whatever. It's best to get up there as early as you can. This group comes along and they see him sitting. He's sitting on the ridge. He's dangling his feet over. It's like a 10,000 foot drop down and he's got his suit off and that's hypothermia. 50% of all die of hypothermia are found with their clothes off because there's some kind of phenomenon where in the final throes of hypothermia, your body sends blood rushing to your extremities and you get like a hot flash and people are taking the clothes off. So he's sitting there without his snowsuit on and these guys come along and he says to them, I bet you're surprised to see me. And they were like, "Uh, yeah. Who are you? What are you doing? And he says, I'm Lincoln Hall. And people had heard of him. They had heard of his experience, you know, in the 80s, etc. And there was a few other things that he had done. He wrote books. I think he wrote like eight books. And so he they radio down. They, they figure out that he's alive. And they radio down. Now, his family's been told that he was dead. His wife and his sons were told that he was dead. Greg Mortimer was told he was dead. The whole world was told that he was dead. And now they're saying, uh, this guy is saying that he's Lincoln Hall. And they're like, oh my God. So they give him oxygen. They stay with them. They send Sherpas back up there. It takes the Sherpas hours to get up there. And the guys that stayed with him then didn't have enough oxygen, energy, everything to get up to the summit and get down in a safe time. So none of the guys that they had a great shot at the summit at that point. But one of the guys said that in a a subsequent interview that I saw the guys that rescued him, one of the guys said that he got an email from a friend who said, I don't know what I would have done if I had heard you left that guy and went on to summit. And that was part of the ethical discussions about Everest, which is not the point of this podcast. The point of this podcast was, after I saw this movie, Miracle on Everest, and there was a book that Lincoln Hall wrote about this, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. So the Sherpas get down, and it was still a grueling, grueling exercise to get him down off the mountain. I mean, he was still hallucinating. He was still trying to fight the Sherpas, and you know, all kinds of things was going on. So he wrote a book on this. I, I watched a bunch of lectures that he did, things like that. And after I saw that movie, I was like, oh, meditation. Damn, I had meditated in a bunch of years. And I thought, that's what I need to do. That's what I need to be doing. I'm in freaking in bed anyway. I might as well do that. So I, after seeing the movie Miracle and Everything, watching a bunch of interviews with Lincoln Hall, I went back to my meditation practice. Because as I'm watching, as I'm listening to his lectures and I'm watching the movie, I'm thinking that makes total sense that his meditation practice is what basically saved his life. Not that I'm going to be left on Mount Everest overnight, not that that's going to happen to me and save me, but it made total sense to me that his meditation is what saved him. But I regained the practice of meditation within two weeks. I started to feel better and I started to actually look forward to meditating in the morning and look forward to meditating and it didn't take me long to get back into it. And I have a Stephen Andre Levine grief process audio. And there was a meditation on that. And I slept to that audio for years after Michael passed. And the meditation that they do happens fairly early in the audio. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And for years, I fell asleep to that grief meditation. I wouldn't get through the whole grief meditation before I'd be asleep. And it really, really helped me. But after I started my meditation practice again, After about two weeks, I was calmer. I was more attentive. I had more energy. I was still really battling lupus and I wound up on chemotherapy in February, about six weeks after I saw that movie. And I really struggled with chemo for most of that year. I had a really, really tough time, but the meditation really helped me. If you read this section of the Power Affirmations booklet, that's not about affirmations. It's about everything else to do to keep positive. I discuss how 
the daily practice of these things helps you in your life in so many ways and so many areas. And that's one of the reasons I try to stay unplugged. I get up about seven o'clock in the morning if I haven't been up all night because I'm an insomniac. But if I get up at seven o'clock in the morning, I stay unplugged for a while. And then around nine o'clock, I check email, I check Facebook group. And then I write out my schedule for the day. I check email, check Facebook group again around noon, check email, check Facebook group around four or six. And then I do it again before I go to bed. I don't stay on my phone or my computer all day. I just don't. It makes me very unproductive. Between observation, meditation, mindfulness, it is very important and it makes a huge difference in your life. If you're not doing those things, please try to do them. You become more efficient. You become more energetic. You become more aware. You become very focused on things. And again, we'll talk about being able to tell if people are lying, people not lying, what are people doing? But after I started meditating again, I started to have this unbridled enthusiasm for meditation and I just couldn't wait to do it. And sometimes I'll even do it now in the middle of the day if I'm not feeling well. I'll say, okay, I'm just going to try to meditate for a while. A lot of times I'll go to sleep and I have horrible insomnia, horrible insomnia. And if I can meditate in the middle of the day, many times I'll go to sleep for a couple of hours and that refreshes me. makes me feel great. So I don't teach meditation because I'd be yelling at people to relax their legs. I don't teach mindfulness. So much material out there. You don't need me to do it. You just need me to remind you of it. I do teach observation. Observation is kind of my baby. I Like many other parts of the GPYB program, I started that. The way I teach affirmations is very unique to GPYB. A lot of the names that I have for different types of affirmations because I want people to understand the difference between affirmations, how to put an affirmation set together, et cetera. I I didn't create, I didn't make up affirmations, but I teach it in a somewhat unique way. Don't shortchange your program. Do all of it. Remember, prejudice is contempt before prior investigation. If you haven't done meditation, if you haven't done relaxation, if you haven't done mindfulness, if you haven't done observation, if you haven't done unplugging, please do it. Just do it. It will make a huge difference. And it might not come within 24 hours. It might not even come within two weeks like it did for me, but it will come. Keep doing it. Okay, I'm still working on a whole bunch of things. I want to thank the new meanies. I I didn't thank you on this program. I will thank you on another program. Thank you so much. Let's keep the podcast going. Send me an email. Let me know what you want to hear. I'm still working on Jody Arias stuff. I'm still working on the sex show. I'm still working on a few other things. And I'm working on some shows for the meanies. So thank you guys so much. Talk to you later. Do your observation, meditation, mindfulness, etc. Bye-bye. Nelly, Cousin Elaine Talk Podcast. Take care all. Bye-bye.